I think I fixed it, everybody. Oh, rad. Let's see. I try to start your video. Can you all hear me? Oh. Oh. Rock and roll. True. Did you say Shazam? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Reese Museum's virtual opening and artist talk for contemporary culture makers. Curated by Jocelyn Matthews, this exhibition features 10 local artists and will be on display at the Reese Museum through March 12, 2021. For information about the Reese Museum, please check out the links in the description below. Please enjoy the program. Yeah, well, welcome everybody. Let me see, I think we have someone waiting to pop in. That's my mom. Okay, she's, she's already, we got our first visitor. So I love but, supportive parents. I'm really hoping my mom's to me, tuning into this. So this will be yeah. her first, uh, first art opening she'll be in attendance for. So fingers crossed for the, mom, for the family support. Great, um, at this point we are broadcasting. So at, at whenever we want to officially start. So, I, hi mom, I guess she's watching me right now, but uh, um, folks will be able to add Q&A. Um, I think all of you all have access to the chat, so the public can't read these questions. Um, so if stuff comes through, only you and I will be able to read those. I can see both the Q&A and the chat, so that's good. Yeah, so right. everyone can kind of like pay attention to that. Uh, I talked to Jocelyn a little bit about, you know, I'm gonna kind of get started a little bit, just welcome everyone. Um, but then I'm gonna get behind this cart and just kind of wheel it around for gallery view for around 15, 20 minutes. That so is awesome. It, has, yes. anybody, has anybody act, else actually physically been to the show after it's been installed? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. everybody just dropped off their work and it was like, poof. Yeah. Okay. We've had visitors and uh, yes. a few people have been in. And I know uh, Tony had some folks come by. Yeah, had some folks come by Monday. They were in the studio after that, about two and a half hours. It went really well. Really good couple. Yeah. I went so there twice after taking the wrong thing. So I got to see it the second time at the very end and it looks amazing. But I got home after driving to Johnson City and looked at my wall and saw the piece I thought I had framed and delivered. Um, but that being said, the, it looked amazing. Everything was on oh, the Oh, look, there's on the right there. That was, um, oh shoot. It's a little higher than the camera angle. The two monoprints on the, on, the, on the right wall. And although I'm probably gesturing incorrectly for people whose cameras are not mirrored. Um, Oh, yes, 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 that's a much better view. Yeah, thank you, Spencer. This is beautiful. What is it like for y'all to see your your work in a in a physical space, but virtually? That's got to be a new experience for some. Well, it's not for me, thanks to you, Jocelyn. This is my second virtual time, so. But I'm just, <laughs> I'm just still shocked every time my art's any place that's not stacked behind me on the floor so it's, you know it's nice yeah. and there's Lincoln's beautiful book I, I wish we had like some kind of microscopic zoom for all of the tiny details and everything scales a little difficult when you're trying to eyeball this but Lincoln's work is has got that's some so cool. some that's nice good, little easter eggs in there that's a good question is the difficulty of showing 2D and 3D work virtually because I know like I have the issue where my stuff looks different in person because of the way it's printed and the paper it's on and so it's I don't know I feel like I, I feel like sorry I feel like it's a good reminder for me let me make sure my phone is on yeah, it always calls me I feel like it's more, like exposition is more important I think I don't know oh it looks like we've got Cosmo he is in the chat so maybe we can let him in on the conversation. He just said, can you see me? So let's let Cosmo in because we're going to, right now we're in the Ruby corner of the exhibit. Welcome Cosmo. Whenever you get a chance, you can unmute yourself and show us your face. And over here is Jay. I don't, I didn't know, I don't know if he's planning on joining us. Um, he, he said he would be available. So hopefully he pops in. Yeah, I hope so. There's his work. Oh, yeah. 
I saw a lot of it on the floor when I dropped off because I was like, <laughs> I think I was probably the last person because I'm a slacker. Uh, no, you weren't. Um, no, you weren't. Okay. Oh, good. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> I'm like Stacy. And these are Stacy's screen prints. Oh, wow. We were able to do a happy birthday Dolly Parton the other day. I saw that. That made my heart so happy. Her piece was amazing when she first made it for the positive negative show that it did not get into. And I was like, well, I'm going to put it in my show. That's so <laughs> surprising. Well, there was a lot of other work that, you know, it's always, it's competitive. And this is Mary Knees, who I don't think is with us right now on the Zoom, but she does um, also does painting and um, a few other mediums as well. Ah, I'm unmuted. How's what we can hear you? But you can't see me. No, it's a fun that's thing. okay. This is, my, this is my this is my first Zoom. I'm, you guys keep talking. I'm going to figure this out. Welcome to the Zoom world. Spencer, um, can you spin the camera around to show Cosmo his work in situ? I think it's more important to see me. I feel like I just, I need like, I feel like I'm playing a video game where I'm driving the car. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> surreal. It's really surreal. Yeah, look at all that. Okay, I have an iPad. What should I be hitting here? So I see you guys, oh, but yes. shouldn't I see a little me somewhere? There should be towards the bottom. You should see an icon for sound, for video and sound, and you should be able to click on video and turn it on. Or if I'm trying to remember my daughter's iPad, it might be in the upper left. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, I'm an Apple, all... or not an Apple. Whatever. Well, it like shows that. me with a uh, icon, dude. I'm sorry, you guys. Uh, I just got off a telehealth thing and now <laughs> with a psychiatrist, no doubt. Uh, virtual background. Shit. Uh, wait a minute. The switch to active speaker. What would that do? Now that yeah. would mean that whoever was talking would be the main one that appears on your screen. Okay. So th this is not artist talking. This is a Zoom tutorial, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I think they all start with a little yeah. bit of a Zoom tutorial. And then everything gets going. At least most yeah, of the time I've seen. Someone will be doing this. <laughs> <laughs> somebody come over. Got somebody you covered. Come over? Yeah. Can somebody come to the house real quick? I'm hitting my okay. Mute pin. Hide not video. Hide self view. No. It sh it should look like a to directly to the right of the mute button. <laughs> And you'll oh, click. maybe um, I don't think you're cussing enough, and that may be why you're having troubles with it. <laughs> well, I hate but... more squares. There you are, there you are. It's a hand. Oh, 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 you hit a button and we saw it just for a half second. All right. <laughs> How about there that? You, yeah. There you are. Okay, everybody do a little dance am I, party. Am I framed great. and stuff? You're you're good. You're good. Okay. Oh, you've even got a piece in your in the background, so you can oh, you match mark. what's on the screen now. It's I'm great. I'm starting to actually market myself. <laughs> All right. Well, it's good to see you guys. It's um, beautiful. Thank you, everybody, for making time to come and at least well, share some thoughts about your work. I really. My name's Cosmo. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have uh, seven attendees so far. So for folks who are logging on, thank you. And, uh, yeah, we'll sure. This is cool. Here soon, but yeah, I think uh, we all the artists that I know that told us that they were going to be here have signed on so far. So I think we have our panel. We are the panel. Yeah. All right. Good deal. Very panel is go-go. Well, it's nice to see you guys. Again, I'm sorry, but I don't know everybody's name and all that. Um, I probably know your artwork, but I mean, this sounds Spencer okay. Is going Can to we take go us around on... and say our names? Well, Spencer is going to take us on a little tour of the gallery. This is Tony oh, okay. Henson's art. He is on the wall. He's I don't I don't know if how available you are to see him in terms of the screens and everything. But Tony is an abstract painter. Tony, do you have any more things that you want to say? Just to briefly introduce yourself while we're staring at your beautiful paintings. I've been painting for thirty years, and I teach um, drawing classes at Dobbins Bennett right now. Cool. Yes, thank you for getting in close. Very good. <laughs> Tony's work talking? is very textured and yeah. um, and luminous, I would say, which does not come through virtually. But if you get a chance to walk down into the exhibit, which you should, if 
You yeah, can. I need to go there in person now that everybody's stuff is up. Um, oh, yeah. And Tony, is this a panel of three or is this a single? Yeah, that's a triptych. It's three feet by nine feet. I sold that one uh, Monday. Congratulations. Thanks. Awesome. Cool. So if we swing around, we can't, well, we will um, hit Lakin's book and then Eric's work. Correct? Yeah. Remembering the geography of the space a little bit there. You got to make a map. Yes. So Lakin, do you have a few moments to introduce yourself to our audience and um, to the rest of the artists here that you're in the midst of? <laughs> Hello, I'm Lakin. <laughs> Hi, Lakin. I'm a printmaker by training. Um, I um, work at William Key Museum in education and I manage art lab. Um, this book is something I made at Penland um, several years ago, it was my first experience in bookmaking, and it is uh, titled Journey, and it's about my journey, learning how to make an accordion book and uh, make paste paper, uh, and it was done in grad school. Uh, one of my uh, uh, grad advisors said that grad school is, is like having a um, personal crisis in public <laughs> <laughs> and paying for one <laughs> paying so. for a crisis <laughs> yeah. here's my money let me have a breakdown exactly i had mine for free it's a beautiful book it's i want to see book. that because you can tell that's something you got to come and look at well know? and there's, a, there's a narrative that you see when it's fully expanded and that you can see if you you know if you hunt okay. around on the inside. So it's worth the trip. Cool. Very cool. Thank you, Lincoln. Sure. <laughs> here we go, driving around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is neat. I love this. And here is Eric's piece, which um, definitely the physical presence of it um, is a, something not to be oh, missed yeah. because you could wrap yourself up in this like it's a blanket. It's pretty gigantic. So it's pretty big. And Eric, will you share a few words about your background? Introduce yourself very briefly. Sure. Um, I'm Eric Smith. I, uh, I'm a political scientist and specifically international and comparative politics up at University of Virginia at Wise. And uh, I am also, I guess, a working artist. I'm, I'm over at the William King Museum in the Chavatel studio. And uh, I, I paint ugly things. Um, no, I think I was looking at your site a couple days ago. Oh, really? Cool. Re yeah, I like the uh, well, I like your work, but I I thought that's a cool combo: political science and painting. It is. A, so, it's weird. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're a free thinker then. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Machiavelli yeah. wrote wrote plays. I I paint. Crazy well, things. I, I have an NRA sticker and a Ramon sticker on my car. <laughs> so just to let people know, <laughs> nobody's got me. Uh, anyway, sorry. I like that. Thank you. That's that was that's my big plague painting. That's the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Oh wow. So I started it right when the plague kind of lockdown began. So yeah, I was gonna say yeah. that's timely. I'm feeling yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was, you know, it was created in, in, within the last 365 days. So the stains yeah. are on the wall behind me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Most of this work is actually fairly recent. That was something that Spencer pointed out to me, not um, in one of our previous communications. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah. That. Yeah, I was, de I was definitely as a curator, I was interested in what's happening right now in our region. Okay, so next up, uh, Anna, I'm, I'm like finding you. Yeah. Anna Buchanan yeah. on the spot. Will you yeah. talk about these pieces or at least tell us like, cause I know that you have more than one, you have two mediums basically going here. So tell us about yeah. you and your work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so my name is Anna Buchanan. Um, I also work at William King Museum of Art. Um, I'm the curator for the contemporary art. Um, moved here a year ago two weeks before the pandemic hit so oh my God. um you know just just was starting out and then it was like bam gotta go back inside and and hide from people hide from the world i guess so um i'm getting to know many of you 
Um, Jocelyn, I actually just realized you were the same Jocelyn that I signed up for emails for, for like the art opportunities. So I'm slowly, I'm slowly but surely putting everyone's names and faces together. So, um, but so yeah, new to the area and um, I prep my emphasis is in drawing, but um, I do a little bit of uh, soft sculpture sewing, so. Very cool. Thank you for driving us around, Spencer. Yeah. I hope he can hear us all right. I think Jocelyn around here is the gateway to anything. No, not. I'm no, I'm finally learning that. <laughs> you're, you're important. You're important. I've been okay. so alone. I've been so alone. This is. Oh, OK. Uh, so can we swing actually around to Richard's work for a moment? So Ruby had to step out for a minute. <laughs> I think that That's Spencer a, is going to get his steps in while who, everyone else just who sits made on the our moving butts. bearded guy. That's pretty neat. <laughs> <laughs> that took a lot of work. All right, so here we have Richard's work. Richard, will you briefly introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. My name's uh, Richard Graves. I'm from Abingdon, Virginia. I call it the Wolf Hills of Virginia, just because I think that sounds really cool when I'm online sometimes. Um, and my background's in broadcast journalism, and I've just recently made the transition to be a working artist as my kind of primary um, passion and workflow. So I'm in kind of a new, a new spot and trying to do a lot of things. I'd gotten very comfortable in doing like smaller watercolor mixed media pieces. So I've been trying to branch out and do mixed media with, on a much larger scale. You know, these 16 by 20s were pretty big for me for what I had done um, in the past. And they're pretty explicitly influenced by Sabrina Lamb, who's another um, Abingdon artist and curator. I borrowed a lot from her. And a lot of these came from um, conversations I was having with Sabrina and my kind of elevator pitch for the art that these, um, these would definitely be a part of. As I say, I try to illustrate the ghosts of things that haunt us through like portraiture and figure drawing. Um, so this was kind of an attempt to do some new materials and a kind of new direction for my art as I'm kind of bouncing around and figuring out what works, what sells, what resonates with people and what I feel you know, confident and proud of. As a curator, curator I gravitated towards these just because you were, you were doing portraiture and portraiture I think is very, is, you know, it's a challenging, uh, it's a challenging medium through which to communicate things. Um, and, and it's very, um, I don't see a lot of figurative work necessarily, like at least my experience of what's happening in the region tends to be like, it's very focused on the land and the landscape uh, because it is a very beautiful resource and, and it's completely surrounds us. So I was interested in some figurative things in addition to abstraction and, um, maybe not as traditionally minded. And I see the portraiture, a lot of that being connected to my background in journalism, because when I was doing radio, I was trying to find, when I was telling a story or communicating an idea, the, I, the thought would be to find a person or an interview to kind of communicate that. So I always see kind of the human body as, or the human face as just something that resonates with me when I'm trying to think about how to incorporate an idea in a piece that's always kind of through people is what me as, how I as a viewer um, am most affected by work. So I kind of use that as the entry point when I'm trying to communicate things is how do I do that through the human form or the human face? Thank you. I, um, and I think we're gonna jump straight into abstraction because we haven't hit Ruby's corner yet and had her introduce herself. So. Uh, I'm Ruby Berry. I am a film photographer um, I kind of, I kind of am split between two things. I mainly think of myself as a portrait photographer and I do the kind of studio lit, you know, zone system shooting, really like thought out methodical portrait work. And then I do this stuff, which is um, basically, it's an alt process where I destroy the film before I shoot it. And it's kind of a long arduous process and then but afterwards after the film's been soaked in various things like i'll boil it um that one drawing down the moon was soaked in uh check my cheat sheet because i always forget that one was soaked in pop rocks and sprite 
<laughs> yeah. That's know. awesome. Yeah. It's, it's, so do you do you work where's the vending machine in your studio? So much candy. <laughs> so much candy. Uh, the other one to the left of that mother was um Mentos and Diet Coke. Yes, that's the right one. Oh wow. That. And uh so that's kind of I went through a whole candy phase with it. Um the other one, Black Hole Sun, was uh baking soda and vinegar. And I actually um, this was like a really dark, gray, horrible, bleak day. And so I took my cameras to Michael's, the craft store, and shot the kind of colorful things there, thinking that it might be much prettier than shooting outside at that time. So yeah, it's a lot of the times I shoot what I can. I mean, I have kids, I homeschool. Um, so it's a lot of the things are stuff from my backyard, stuff from the grocery store, craft store. So it's just kind of shooting when I can, when I can. And and learning the different effect that chemicals have on the film and what it does to it. So, I mean, I never really know exactly what I'm gonna get, but at this point I do sort of, I can tell you what certain things will do to the, either the, the emulsion itself or whether they'll, they'll adhere to the film surface. And so it's, but it's, it's the exact opposite of how I normally shoot. So it's good fun. I, I wanted to draw attention to if, if Spencer wouldn't mind if it's possible to get uh, the two mothers into the frame in the gallery because I very intentionally like I, as I was gathering y'all together it might not be possible well look at that okay so we've got oh, I love that. one mother on one side and then um, Anna Marie's mother on the other side because oh. I was you know, I was I was picking up little threads between things, and I know that um, if I'm remembering correctly, there's a synesthetic connection between Ruby and Tony. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like there's a little bit of that. So Ruby and Tony are actually on like opposite sides of the gallery, and so there's so there's like some physical relationships going on, and um, some of the other artists who weren't here, I also kind of made connections in between their work. So I was kind of like. It was sort of like following the rabbit hole all the way around the gallery between people who, um, whose work I was looking through and resonating. So I, like I was trying to connect the theme together. together. The shapes in both of the two mother pieces are similar too. That's amazing. <laughs> That's beautiful. Um, so far, we don't have any questions from the audience, but I would like to mention to whoever is watching that you were more than welcome to pose any questions. If you want to ask a specific artist a specific question about a piece that you just saw, um, please, you know, address address the artist themselves if you can remember which one it was. <laughs> and we we're very happy to answer your questions and talk about the work some more. Spencer, do you have any words that you would like to share? Yeah, I'll, I'll give my little pitch now and at the end. One, this show is open to the public. Um, we do have precautions in place. The only reason I'm not wearing a mask is because I'm the only one in the building. So, uh, uh, so for folks who just, you know, this is giving you a taste, obviously we're very aware that this is a virtual viewing and to really experience it the correct way, if you can safely be here, we'd love to host you. And you can always call the museum um, at 423-439-4392, or you can visit us on the web, etsu.edu forward slash Reese, R-E-E-C-E, um, and this will be probably edited down slightly and posted. So if you really enjoy this or you enjoy certain artists or you want to get back in touch, please contact the museum. A lot of these folks, you'll um, this is their livelihood. So a lot of the works or like works, I'm assuming, will probably be for sale. So um, the museum can serve a little bit of a hub where we don't deal with that. But just like Tony, you know, we, we set up a, a visitation of some prospective buyers and so if any work, of course, I want to pitch out and do our part for an artist. You know, if you want to buy it, you know, a lot, a lot of people will take your money. Um, beyond <laughs> that, I appreciate that, Spencer. Now we're talking. <laughs> beyond that, the exhibition will physically be on display through March 12th. The museum is open Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And like Jocelyn said, we're gonna be checking out the gallery, um, talking to these artists. So please, uh, I'll be paying attention to the chat box. Um, otherwise, we'll just keep continuing this conversation. So uh, I'll keep driving. So continue to direct me. 
And I'll, I'll give all the website, phone number, and contact information. I'll do that at the very end as well as a little reminder for folks. Thank you to the artists, all 10 artists for participating. And for uh, the eight right now we have uh, on, on Zoom. So thanks for, for being here. And we're, we're glad to celebrate our contemporary culture makers. Cool. How about you get up and show my artwork? <laughs> What's your problem, man? We, we can swing around to you, Cos. <laughs> While that you're swinging, can I just ask Richard, like, have you been looking at Egon Sheila? Because yes, that, that, that is thing. my my favorite thing to hear from folks. I've gotten uh, from yeah. that. that's a big influence for me. And that's one of the most common comparisons I get on like Reddit. And when I just throw up on the Internet, that's my favorite thing to hear. So thank you. Awesome. No, I totally that's I totally get it. I love I, it. Yeah. Before, I before maybe we dive a little bit more into Cause's work, I would like to share that um, I am so very pleased that all of you uh, took me up on this crazy thing. <laughs> it's it's a true honor to have each and every one of you. I um I wanted to do my best to do um to do honor and. Uh, and justice to the area that has incorporated and adopted a damn Yankee. And um, yeah. I heard you say y'all a minute ago. That was cool. uh, yes. Well, you know, my husband is actually Southern. And so it's a little Good. catching, I'd say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to highlight what was going on right now because, you know, we have, we have a rich history that's often talked about. And we also have some other beautiful organizations that deal in, in crafts and in traditional things like, like Penlin, like Lakin was mentioning and Tennessee craft. And I could go on because there's a lot of wonderful people in this area. And this is like, I want to make sure very clear that this is just this this is just the tip of the iceberg. We're just scratching the surface of all the wonderful people who oh, are yeah. here. And that I, I wish that like we could just fill all the streets with everybody who's <laughs> doing awesome work. Um, but I'm honored to have my little batch of 10 people here. <laughs> so um, I see that somebody in the chat has mentioned that they want to see Tony's work. We will swing around to Tony. Right now we're focusing on cause. Um, and we're going to dive a little deeper into every person's work. So thank you for being here for Tony. Thank you for being here for everybody. Um, now I'm going to put cause on the spot and talk a little. I, want <laughs> I you just to talk... wanted to just feel like. Just... No, no, no. I talk want you to talk it. about like the things like your work is so delightfully precise and stylized. That's a problem, really. It's a problem. It's... Well, for me, it is. I'm, I wear contacts and reading glasses or sometimes I wear glasses and reading glasses over them, which <laughs> is weird looking, but it works. I don't like bifocals. Um, now, I started out as a commercial art major and I took a ton of drafting in high school. So um, then I was a, I switched from design to fine art at ETSU, mostly to get the hell out of school because I had, a, you know, I'm like a lot of people, I majored in drugs and alcohol. And, uh, but, then I did some comic book work, which is very precise, independent stuff. Never got with the big boys. Uh, gave up on that because I realized it's a talent pool about that big. And uh, I did major in painting and drawing. I did a lot of loose stuff with collage and paint. And I just, I don't really, I, that precision thing you talk about, I've actually had somebody say, did you do that digitally? And I thought, no, but I should have. Why, why, would, I, why would I break my Is neck? there an attraction that you have to doing it manually? Oh, and, well, and also, who yeah. would you consider your main influences to be oh, in this well, work? I think in my bio, there's a lot. I mean, I my whole life, I just soaked up the 1950s in whatever form it was, or the 60s and the 40s. Um, I don't know, you know, back when we had feathered hair and bell bottoms, I would look at my dad's yearbook and think, you guys look so much better than we do. <laughs> and, you know, like an old A&W or a McDonald's, you know, or here's an old record catalog. You'll see the kind of oh, motifs beautiful. that were around. Oh, yeah. Um, there's a book, Jim Floor is a big influence on me. 
who did uh, sort of a cartoon version of Picasso, a lot of jazz albums. And um, Stuart Davis, just shape and color, really. Yeah, the, those, those uh, like I said, the motifs and the style. And I, I really like, I mean, a lot of what I do, I guess you'd call art for art's sake. I'm just doing what I want to see. Like, hey, this, you know, um, what was I going to uh, See, this is why I paint, because I can't think. Um, <laughs> if I could say it, I wouldn't paint it. Um, so it's all that stuff. I really, what I'm really gratified to see started happening in the 90s, which I saw in Juxtapose Magazine, was these guys out West weren't making any, any distinction between decorator art, commercial art, and fine art. And like Tim Biscop, I really like. And he was an animator who started painting. And um, Robert Williams probably started it all with the hot rod um, paintings. And, it you know, he was in the 70s before, you know, New York. But he just kept painting. And those things are unbelievable. But a lot of it was considered lowbrow. So just in general, not me in particular, but I'd see young people, and especially on the Internet, and they don't make that distinction, you know? And I think mm -hmm. to me, that's just great because I, you know, I showed you this stuff, but I also actually have some drawings of monsters that I did a little bit of private teaching and I told the kid, these are so great, I'm going to steal some. <laughs> and he said, no, you'll become rich and famous, but I stole some because I like the monsters. It's not, you know, it's pretty simple stuff really. And if somebody, get something out of you know i mean it's the way i look at things it's well it's challenging to do every, something somebody that is could, simple and to do it well well yeah um, i mean i sometimes i don't know if you guys experience this but if you've been to art school sometimes i was talking to a friend of mine that's a great artist i wish he would come out of his hole more but i said do you ever do things make things hard just because you feel it's supposed to be hard and he said, oh, yeah, okay. you know what I mean? Like, and that's something <laughs> I I'm feel that very deeply. Do say, I've done this a long time. It's OK, man. If this part comes naturally and you're flying through it, let it go. You know, it's all I don't do. Do any of you ever feel that like an obligation that I didn't get a, a big headache out of this? So somehow it's not valid. I would I would love to use this question, if I may, as a transition to talk about Tony's work because sure. he mentioned that he's been painting for 30 years. So I'm curious yeah, to turn that totally. question around to Tony and say, is it especially, easy now? <laughs> well, especially since you're a teacher, Tony, that's- Yeah, mm -hmm. is it easy? What, why do you think about making things hard because they should feel hard? Well, there's, there's a quote out there that um, art is making something um, difficult look easy and entertainment's the opposite. <laughs> you no, know, you know if somebody says well how long did you spend on that painting and I, I can you know like those two back there one's four by six and one's three by nine I probably got three weeks or a month on both of them I mean you know individually I got about a month on each one uh, but there's some paintings that are three by four feet that I can finish completely in four hours because it just flows and right. I think that I mean obviously to me, painting is easier now at almost, you know, at 48 years old than it was when I was 22, for sure. You know, but, you know, there's some nights I come down, I'm in my studio now, and some nights I come down here and paint and like every brushstroke is just crap, it's garbage. You know, and if it doesn't work, you know, after five, six, seven hours, you know, I've been known to take a palette knife or a brush and just throw it through the canvas or slash the yeah. canvas you know, with scissors and say, okay, I'm starting over, just flatline it, start from ground zero and get some more canvas and stretch it. Now I don't do that as much now as I did when I was in my twenties. I used to just tear up canvases and rip them up and, and all that. But I think the, the longer you create art 
if uh, you're not thinking, you know, because a lot of students and uh, people in galleries ask me, like, what were you thinking when you painted that? And I wasn't thinking anything. I was painting. <laughs> you know, like Gerard Richter says, he's one of my favorite artists, Mark Rothko, Joe Mitchell. And he said painting is another form of thinking. So if I'm thinking as I'm painting, it's going to look like crap, right? It's going to be garbage if I'm mm. thinking while I'm painting. So um, after, after 30 years of doing this thing, and, and I create about 40, 45 paintings a year, and I have since I started painting in the early 90s, and um, just to be open, you know, just let everything else melt away. I've got a routine. I'll come down in the studio. I'll set my chair. I'll listen to a couple songs of music. And, um, you know, when I hear music, I see colors, whether it's Alice in Chains or jazz or you know, rap, anything. Like when I listen to music, I see colors. So that helps me to paint fast and in a quick way. Do you intentionally, do you intentionally choose your music based on what you would like to create? No, just what I'm in the mood to hear. Like what I'm in the mood to hear. I just, I just base it on that. And of course I don't do any sketches. I don't plan anything. I have no idea. Like either one of those paintings, no idea where it was going to go. Like when I first started painting, and then I just kind of let it develop. It's kind of like um, the students at Dobbins Bennett, the advanced drawing class that I get the privilege to teach. 13 students in there, they're amazing. So I was showing them how to do a gesture drawing. So I had a student pose in the middle of the class. I said, I'm gonna draw you within 20 seconds. I'm gonna draw you head to toe. I'm gonna do a gesture drawing in charcoal and I'm gonna draw you in 20 seconds. Somebody else get up there, I'll draw you in 40 seconds. It's like, that's easy, right? And I've been doing that. I've been drawing like that for 35 years. So then when they started like, wow, this is really hard. I'm like, of course it's hard because you're trying to look at the figure head to toe and move your arm as right. fast as you're looking and your arm is not going to go as fast as your eyes can see. So when I'm listening to music and I'm seeing color and I'm thinking about the landscape because my paintings are about how I see and experience color in nature so sunset, sunrise, fog, flowers, waterfall, rivers, moss, anything, everything in nature is in my painting. So I'm painting fast because I'm seeing the colors, listening to music, and I'm thinking about the landscape that's right outside my studio. So yeah, it's easier now, but I, I still struggle. You know, there's still nights where every brushstroke is garbage, and then I'll paint for three or four hours. I'm like, okay, tonight I suck. I'm done. Maybe tomorrow it'll be better. Can I ask you? Question? Thank, thank Tony? you, Tony. Thank you. Sure. It's Go ahead, Tony, Cosmo. Tony uh, I guess what I was getting at was a little different because you've painted a long time. So have I. But it's um, once you're so, quote, educated is when you do something that's fast. Maybe this is a personal problem with me. Do you ever feel like you cheated? Like it's not There's valid that, because I did that painting. Right, in because yeah. you didn't sweat and strain over it or something. Yeah, there's things like that, but I- It's but a I silly kinda, notion, but I know people, I go yeah. through that, you know? I kind of, um, well, for me personally, I would rather create a painting that flows and it's done in six hours than to have migraines and work on something three months. <laughs> right. Eventually it's gonna suck. <laughs> no, that I gotta makes start over. Because I spent two months on a painting and then just scrapped it. Just yeah. tore it up with scissors yeah. and scrapped it. Yeah. So like if it comes out to me, like, yeah, it's valid because it's about emotion and expression. So it's raw and, and pure, you know? Okay. Like instead of being labored over, you know, I'm not a mechanic trying to fix a car. Like I'm, I'm creating art, you know, based on emotion and expression. So if it comes out in five hours, that's beautiful, you know? That's great. Okay. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you for sharing all of those details about your practice. Um, just, just so everyone knows in the interest of, um, of time, um, I'm just going to try to make sure that we move along through everybody's work. I, I could talk to each of you for like four hours. <laughs> um, like we've just scratched the surface of Tony, but let's um, turn the camera and talk about Lakin's work and her little book, but then also um, Lincoln, I know that you, this is not necessarily your primary medium. Is that correct? When we swing around to your uh, accordion book, you mentioned that you were a printmaker by, uh, as I, your primary. I am a printmaker by training. Um, I would say at this point, I'm a mixed media artist. 
Are we freezing uh, up a little? Am I, am I freezing up? Just, uh, you, just you worse, but yeah. A little bit, but I think we're all right. Um, yeah, I, I am a printmaker by training, but at this point, um, I'm more of a mixed media artist. I do a lot of drawing and um, it kind of just has flown, flowed into making books. But um, if, there any, is there, if there's anyone here who is a bookmaker or has true bookmaking training, <laughs> I am not a book artist. <laughs> <laughs> The, the craft is okay for me, but I don't think it's okay for a bookmaker. <laughs> so um, just because this is only one uh, piece that doesn't necessarily represent like your main medium, uh, where else can we see your work right now? Just as a, as a point of curiosity. Uh, I, I was just in uh, Transforming Politics, which closed at the um, museum. But you can go to my website, lakeandbridges.com, and I have a fair amount of work um, on that website. Um, we actually have a few questions from the audience that uh, maybe Lakin could start answering if you don't mind. I'm gonna put you on the spot again. We have, um, I think I can batch these questions into two, um, a, a two-part question. Um, one of the questions is, does working in Appalachia help hinder or have no bearing on your work? And I think a question that is overlapping our experience right now is how has the pandemic affected your work? So maybe about Appalachia in the first place and then maybe how the pandemic has overlaid that a little bit. And I think we can just go around and popcorn this thing. Do you want me to start it? Please do. Um, okay, well, for me, I, I love living and working in Appalachia. Um, I went to grad school in South Carolina, and then before I came back to the Tennessee, Southwest Virginia area, I was um, teaching in Ohio, Southern Ohio, so um, I've always kind of been in Appalachia. <laughs> um, and my, if, you, if you go to my website, you'll see that a lot of my work looks at uh, social class and labor. Uh, so a lot of that just rolls right into Appalachian culture and our history here. Um, but, you know, of course can apply elsewhere. So I, I find that there's a lot of fodder <laughs> for me here. Um, and uh, uh, there's, there's so much related to labor and class that uh, I think the rest of the country gets wrong. Um, so that's a, that's a point of interest for me um, in terms of the pandemic affecting my work. I've, I've actually hardly made anything this past year um, because <laughs> it actually the pandemic involved me working like over overtime every week <laughs> all last year. I worked a lot. So it's actually kind of been the reverse for me than uh, for a lot of people in terms of working outside and making art. Right, Trade-offs for everyone. Does anyone else have a burning answer to the question? With the pandemic, I mean, it's uh, for me a lot of it because I'm not, you know, I like to sell at art markets and craft fairs and stuff. And so that didn't happen. And so when the pandemic started, I anyhow somehow find myself running an underground bakery for my porch <laughs> to make up for the loss mm -hmm. of our income. And so, and that's, I enjoy doing it. it. It hits a lot of the same things that making art does, but the downside of that is between the time that that takes up and the just weird emotional and intellectual headspace I've been in because of the pandemic. I've hardly made any art this year. I mean, I've shot film, but I've got film sitting upstairs in developing tanks that I haven't even, I just don't even want to see what's in there. It's, 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 it's just put me in a weird headspace. And I think because I had this year, or 2020, I had a huge um, portrait project planned, which obviously couldn't happen either. So for me, it's just been kind of trying to give myself the grace and the space to let my wheels spin for a while, while I just try to figure out what I feel like making and what's going to come next, and sell bread to make money. I don't know. It's it's been it's been a strange thing. But I've I've definitely heard that from other other artists and uh, creators that in some ways it's been hard to create during this time. And I think um, I can raise my hand for that. Anybody else want to raise their hand for that? 
or e maybe it's come easy. And if not, like I know some people who are very prolific or who it's given them new opportunities. Um, Ruby, do you think that working in Appalachia helps hinders or has no bearing on your work? I don't think it has, that's a hard thing to say. For portrait stuff, I think so, because for, you know, portraits to me are more of a narrative. And so it's, I like to shoot people I know. So that's definitely a thing. But as far as help senders, or it helps me in the sense that I love my community and I get to have both the support of other artists but also people that inspire me in other ways. But other than that, I don't think it's really, you know, it, it really doesn't have any bearing other than the fact that I'm Southern and I love where I live and I feel kind of like other people mentioned that a lot of people in other areas of the country don't really understand how rich and diverse and progressive and creative this area is. And that's, you know, I, it's, it's my home both physically and sort of emotionally and mentally as well. Does anybody else have any reflections on whether or not being in Appalachia has a bearing on their work? Overlay I pandemic. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I, I would probably be doing the same thing anywhere, even though I love it here. Um, you know, that's when I'm in, I think at least some of you can relate when you're in your little secret space, everything goes away, you know, I mean, except what you're doing. So I love that I could walk out on this porch and see beautiful mountains. And I love the people. My mom was from Tennessee. Um, it's great, you know, but as far as just what I do, and it depends, everything's good with me. You know, I have people that, you know, uh, do work about the area. That's terrific. But for well, me- Well, has the pandemic changed, um, changed your practice? Well, in all honesty, the year before the pandemic, my wife was battling breast cancer, which luckily, bam, she beat. So that rocked our world. And then as she was just finishing up chemo, the pandemic hit. And the main thing as far as is just getting back into, I had a routine and you know, I kind of looked up and thought, what the, what the hell was I doing? Where was I at? You know, what was I doing? And, uh, and other than that, things like this, I, you know, before <laughs> all this started, I was like, Hey man, you got to get out of your bubble and start connecting with some people. And then not any place I thought of that I would normally go, or let's go there more, you know, let's go see, well, they're all gone, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, uh, uh, that's hard. It, it gave me a new goal just to stop being such a hermit, I guess, but <laughs> We'll have to, you know, that's going to be nine months. So, you know, and there's Netflix, so it's cool. Everything's good. <laughs> well, I know that Eric was about to speak up for a minute. Can we, what do you have to like reflections on Appalachia, reflections on the pandemic? On With Appalachia, I, I grew up in West Virginia and I've lived in East Tennessee and Southwest Virginia and the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia and like all over the mountains. And, um, I am like being Appalachian is like critical to who I am. It is, it is a huge part of who I am. And, and it has this weird way it combines with the fact that I study non-Western politics principally, like, like, and because I was, I was trained as an artist and I've always been interested in non-Western and I'm also very, very interested in like folk art traditions of Appalachia and art brut and, and, um, some of the artists I grew up seeing in, as a kid impacted me, even if I wasn't necessarily, like if I didn't know their names, you know, um, Gary Bowling from Bluefield, and now I think he was in Princeton, had a, he, he did Gary Glyphics, he called them, and they were like pop art, uh, Keith Haring-esque, and, and they had this huge impact on me as a kid. And, um, but being Appalachian, I also think is, it's interesting when you're like a modern, artist any ilk of modern artist um i think it's been mentioned you know the landscape tendency in appalachia like i don't make pretty art i make art that is yeah it's weird and awesome i love it i'm very proud of it but it and that that's an interesting dichotomy like i'm taking art 
that is inspired by Keith Haring and Ukiyo-e and put it in the middle of West by God, Virginia, you know, but, and then the pandemic, you know, I'm a, I, I have an immune, a compromised immune system and uh, I have been in hiding. Lake and maybe the person I've seen the most because her office is down from my studio. And so we pass each other and we see each other in our masks and shoot the bull. But I, 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 I'm severely isolated. And um, at the same time though, work has been, my, my professorship stuff has all shifted online. And I've had to redesign literally everything I do for my day-to-day -day job. So I work less, but when I work, it's got this huge emotional content from the plague and, and, um, and it's, yeah, so it's, it's had a huge impact, but it, I, I, not as much, but maybe I really like some of the pieces I've done. I, I think I have to ponder on them more because I'm sitting here reading stuff. I'm like, I want to get done because I want to paint. <laughs> yeah. Well, I certainly, um, I certainly liked one of the pieces. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, sadly, Mary Knees is not with us this evening, whose work is on the screen at the moment. But um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put someone else on the spot here. I'm gonna put Anna Buchanan on the spot to answer the question. Uh, the recent, the recent uh, acquisition to Appalachia. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. My work has, um, I, I really gravitate toward eco-feminist principle and philosophy. Um, I'm just coming out of the, um, the, the master's program. I graduated December 2019 from Clemson. So I am coming out of that, um, that heaviness that we were talking about. Yeah. Um, so I think moving here has started to open, it, it's opened my mind to all different kinds of art um, and what that means and how we are starting to, I, I guess, I don't know, just from reading, it seems like the Western world is very set on these boxes, putting like, labels on different types of art um so it's it has opened my mind um but talk, talking about the landscape i do pull from the landscape a lot in terms of visual cues and that eco-feminist principle um and just the how like the land can be othered and then certain bodies are othered so um i'm i come from a, a more urban environment and now like I live in an apartment but there's like cows out my back door <laughs> and I love everything about that um, I love that I I can go outside and be inspired I mean the landscape is certainly um, a huge draw to this place it's made me not want to go back um, I'm, a, I'm a Michigan girl originally so um, you can't roll a, a marble out I mean it's just or, or you can roll no, you can't because it's so flat. It's flatter than a pancake. So, I mean, basically it's, it's influenced some visual cues in my work um, and some of the philosophies I've been, um, been researching lately. Um, in terms of um, the pandemic, um, I guess just seeing, I, I, I'm very by what I'm seeing in, in, in the media. Um, again, I, I also like to research um, Julia Kristeva, who talks about like the abject body and um, bodies that are, again, bodies that are being othered um, and the, the layers that come with that. And so I feel like the pandemic has just opened up so many visual layers of, of how people are, um, experiencing hardships. So that's been, um, I haven't I haven't made any work. I feel like it's all just, I'm soaking it all in. Um, it's percolation time. Yes, yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm having to just sit back um, and think about all the, all the different ways in which, um, I, I guess just seeing the connections between between land, pandemic, bodies. I mean, it's, 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 
a lot to take in. So um, I, I haven't made a lot of work during this time, but yeah, just taking it all in. Thank you for sharing that. And um, as I'm listening to you and some of the others, it occurs to me that, I mean, the, the landscape has been mentioned several times, but it strikes me that it's functioning less as a, um, an item of subject matter in at least all of your work, but it does seem like it's an energy source. So that is very interesting to think that the landscape might at least be partly a thing that we feed on to make our work, even if it doesn't appear explicitly there. Um, I know that I know that we haven't heard from Richard and I, um, in terms of the, the answer to this question, and I know we haven't heard from Tony, am I missing anybody else? Those are the last two in terms of answering these two questions. So um, Richard, let's put you in the hot seat and then we'll circle back again to Tony. Yeah, absolutely. I feel very passionate about this. So I'm glad to get to speak to it. I think this is a phenomenal area to be um, an artist and I don't think I could do it anywhere else. Um, you know, we talk about like the Reese Museum and the William King Museum, like we have a lot of the resources and the institutional support that larger areas have, but we also have, um, you know, this kind of community spirit. I had talked about I mean, one of my influences from journalism um, being kind of about, um, you know, the oral history and kind of that sense of, of communicating with community. And I see that culture of storytelling being very Appalachian and to kind of piggyback on what Lakin and a few others said, the problems that are facing our country and facing our world, we here in Appalachia are on the front lines of that. And I feel like um, artists and folks that live and work in this region, um, you know, are kind of in a unique spot to kind of address those big questions. But since, you know, everything has changed and it's gonna continue to change, um, we're at a place where we have that support, but we also have people that are working together to um, kind of see where the holes are, where the opportunities are, and kind of that community resilience that make use of, of everything and rely on your neighbors and culture. So for you personally, does, the, does being here help or hinder or doesn't seem to affect things? I would say just, absolutely. To clarify for you specifically. For me specifically, absolutely helps. You know, I, I have a lot of interests that are all reflected in, in, in the people and the ideas that are in this, in this region. So I feel more inspired. It's also just a good central location for the places we have when things do open up um, for ease of traveling around. We're at a great location where we have an excellent art community here, but there's so many other pockets of, of art communities and areas um, so close and accessible to us. And I wanted to take a quick opportunity to plug next Tuesday, I'm hosting a panel discussion through um, Arts Alliance of Mountain Empire. And I'm gonna be talking with Jocelyn as well as Brian Surway and Marcy Parks on uh, the culture of art in Appalachia and the pandemic. So we're gonna be trying to chat on those questions a little more in depth next week. Thank you, Richard, and thank you for hosting that. And I know that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of other virtual opportunities happening locally that we can plug. I, I'm pretty sure that there are. I know that in the chat, um, somebody mentioned uh, the great things going on at is this Daniel Boone High School, including Tony. Is that correct? Um, they are doing uh, visual and performing arts, and there's there's um. Richard Brown, the assistant principal, wanted Dobbins, to. Dobbins been at Cora Teach. Oh, sorry. The, the first DB. The first DB. There's two Real <laughs> different, DB. different DBs. Um, somebody asks for Richard if an art supporter can attend the meeting next Tuesday. Do you have an it answer is, for open to the public? It is. That's actually the whole point is for, for folks that want to come on and ask the artist questions. So. Um, welcome, and I'll see if I can put the uh, the link to that in the chat. Okay, so um, now that we've mentioned Dobbins Bennett, um, we're going to swing back around to Tony, and you can talk about you know what your relationship is to Appalachia, if it if you feel that it influences your work, if it helps it or hinders it, and then overlay the pandemic on top of that. Well, I'll, I'll do the pandemic first because that's easy. It hasn't affected me at all. 
Um, that, that's a job description for an artist. Lock yourself in the studio. Don't be around people. Don't go out and socialize. Like that's my job description. Uh, the only time I'm around people is when I'm around the students. Otherwise, I'm down here three nights a week or I'm practicing my bass guitar and hanging out with the family. Uh, I never was like a big social butterfly, even in high school and college. Like you guys want to hang out and go to parties? Is there going to be 300 people there? Yeah, probably. That's okay. I'll stay home. <laughs> um, so it has the pandemic has, hasn't affected me at all. Uh, fortunately, I'm glad it hasn't. Uh, this area, I've lived in Kingsport for 16 years. I got um, my master's in fine art and painting at ETSU, and I lived in Johnson City from 98 until 2000, and I'm originally from right outside of Nashville. So this area has definitely changed the way I paint, look at painting, um, appreciate landscape and abstract painting even more so. Uh, I've traveled all over. I mean, I've been to, I've been to tons of states, traveled a lot, and, you know, it's not the same as this area, you know, like I, I love living in Kingsport. My studio faces west, so I get to see the sunset every day. Um, you know, just, just the mountains, I'm obsessed with fog, the sunset, sunrise, the moss. I love Pacific Northwest. I love Seattle and Portland, Oregon. I've been to Seattle several times. And uh, I could definitely live in Denver, Portland, Seattle, San Diego. I could definitely live there. But uh, like Richard said, I was represented at one point by gallery in DC, Charlotte and Atlanta, all within an easy drive, right? DC, six hours, Atlanta, four hours, uh, Charlotte, three and a half, Nashville, four and a half. The cost of living is amazing, right? Like this house that we live in, in in Portland or Seattle would probably be two million. It's like I don't, I really don't want to leave this house, my beautiful home, and then move somewhere and live in a eleven thousand square foot apartment. You know, I think I'm pretty much, I'm pretty much stuck here, and I love it. Um, I wish there was more um, contemporary art or or more galleries that kind of catered towards my thing. I mean, I'm doing well selling out of my studio. Um, I've sold seven paintings since November, so I'm, I'm doing I'm doing fine with that, but I wish there was more of a place to go, more of a venue that uh, the people in general in this area appreciated what I do more, and there was more outlets to exhibit and show and sell what I, what I work on. I'm of the opinion that that's only a matter of time, but it's a beautiful uh, area. I love it here. <laughs> I love it. Is there anybody who we haven't heard from on those two questions? And um, if I may ask the audience if they have any more questions that they would like to pose, um, we have the Q&A open. I also made sure to, um, to share the event that Richard is hosting next Tuesday. And Lakin just managed to, there's a virtual community critique do you want to say some words on that, Lakin? Yeah, I can share. Um, it's uh, called Art Share, and it's a new series that we're trying out here. Our first winter quarter is virtual. Um, and essentially, I would be creating a, I have a Zoom session where um, attendees can either share uh, do like a screen share of their work or they can send me images or files ahead of time and I can present it for them. And then it's an opportunity to um, share what you're working on, get feedback if that's something you need um, or just connect with other creatives during this time. Really, thank you for sharing that and for hosting that. I know that um, there are several wonderful arts organizations in the area that are working hard to try and make things accessible during the pandemic when you know, art is something that you generally kind of need to teach in person in many ways. Um, there's plenty. I mean, I know that several of you are actually relatively self-taught artists, so it's not impossible to learn things on their own. I'm like, okay, just a show of hands. Who is primarily self-taught? Just as a curious survey, primarily self-taught. I, I, mean, I went to school, then taught myself art. Okay, yeah. <laughs> That's certainly a fair option. I, you know, I would call myself semi-self-taught, like... <laughs> <laughs> Early exposure, self-taught some things, then did some school, then self-taught several other things. 
Yeah, I'm trying to unlearn a lot. <laughs> and Ruby? Yeah, I went to school for not pleasant things. Well, no, I mean, like the English stuff and the classics were, yeah, yeah. I, I'm self taught because I don't, I'm, yeah, I'm much better if it's just me and I can pick and choose how and what I want to learn, whether it's photography or pastry. So, yeah. I could just, like I said, I'll mess it up for free. I'm not going to pay for it. It's <laughs> a good way to look at it. Yeah, I was, I was, uh, I, I copied stuff from encyclopedias as a kid a lot. Yeah. And, and my mom tried to sign me up or she, she did. She signed me up for one art class before high school. And uh, the teacher got angry at me because all I wanted to paint and draw were monsters uh and and things like squids and stuff that she thought was just i guess lowbrow and and i was like yeah it is and it's rad and um yeah. and she uh years later i won the first time i won an art show contest she came up to me while i was standing in front of a piece with my parents and she goes are you that kid who used to paint squids in my class and i'm like <laughs> yeah and the thing that won was a bunch of goblins basically that i had drawn and she just goes, yeah, I figured it was you and just walked away. And I'm like, awesome. <laughs> That's a kind of, but then I, I went to Emory and Henry and I triple majored in art, poli sci and geography. And uh, old Chuck Goolsby, who hates it when I call him Chuck, uh, taught, taught me there and uh, was amazing. Um, but yeah, I still, like I, I, my art here, I'm gonna do a faux pas. Those are my oh. art history books. Wow. So I, I just, I, I'm in an eternal struggle. When I go to New York, all the money I take is to go to museums and bookshops and buy stuff I can't get anywhere else. I'm, I'm constantly trying Thirsty. to steal from people. Yeah. Thirsty. Steal from the best. We have a question. Right. We have a question from the audience um, that says, we are all getting used to doing things online that we would ordinarily do in person. Um, but it occurs to me that there are also some kinds of cool thing, like there's some kind of cool thing about having events online. And what is, what have you enjoyed about putting your work online in this way, or at least this format that maybe, I don't know, reflections on that? <laughs> I hope I said the question correctly. I don't have to leave the house, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> I tend to be pretty, um, I am isolated by nature and I like to stay home. And so that part of it is nice. Um, and I don't have to like try to do grown up stuff like put on grown up clothes and go out and do fancy things. So that, that, that part I, I, I enjoy. Well, I've been doing an online selling and stuff for quite a while not very uh, good at it but um i have you know it's really gratifying to meet people who you know i'm in seattle i'm in, uh, I'm in who knows many you know some just place and them you know and they they don't know me you know but they see the artwork and you know it hits them somehow and pay a few dollars for it, you know, and I've made what I call internet friends, you know, that I don't even know their faces really, but you know, you make a connection. That's really cool, I think. And there's the exposure to other art, my God. You know, <laughs> I have folders from Google, you know, right click, right click, you know, and uh, cause I'm an art fan too, you know, is a big art, you know, and uh, some of it, I go, God, I really stink, you know, now that I see that guy, it's, you know, and some of it, you know, but um, it does show you, and this is, I'm talking about looking at other art, how much talent is in our country and in our world that may not get the exposure, you know, it's just like musicians. There are people here, um, that I really liked before I knew they were from here. Um, but just that, um, cause it is a bit of a solitary thing that, hey, this is going on in every every Johnson city, you know? And that's really cool, I think, you know. I, can I just throw in, I'm the only guy who doesn't see art as a solitary thing, I think. 
and you can ask poor Richard. Richard harasses me all the time. When the plague isn't going on, I go to the brewery and I set up on a table and I draw or paint and I oh I do that. and I listen to music and that's I love it. Oh God! Now I do the the big stuff. Well, I don't know. Sometimes I do it there. Who knows? I make a mess everywhere. Anywhere you see, see a stained table in Abingdon, there's a solid ninety percent chance <laughs> I ruined that table. So, you feet behind it, looking over his shoulder, taking notes. I well, and I know that there are some some artists whose practices are a lot more collaborative or depend on like I'm thinking especially about all of my friends in the performing arts who yeah. um, I mean that's a real struggle I mean in a way yeah. people who make two-dimensional or three-dimensional work you, you know at least yeah. you can photograph it <laughs> but something that's very embodied or that relies on like theater and other things I know that they are suffering in a unique way Absolutely. in this time um, but I'm gonna bounce ping pong that back to someone else. I'm I'm with Eric. I uh, I like to have my solitary time to work, but maybe it's a printmaker thing too. <laughs> I know you study printmaking. It's there's nothing like having that high energy in the print shop when you're you've got ten people printing in the middle of the night and everyone's rooting for each other. <laughs> um, it's kind of fun, but um. Uh, going back to the question a minute ago about like uh, what have we liked about uh, showing our work online or how has that changed? Um, it's not for me specifically, but just this kind of event I've noticed from my work at the museum and from teaching online, something I've noticed from some participants, they have shared with me that these virtual events have helped, um, I guess, like alleviate any anxieties they might have or intimidation they have with the, the museum or the gallery as like an institution. And so that kind of um, approachability and accessibility has been beneficial for some of the people who've connected with me. Yeah, I, I can feel that 100% because I'm, I'm still relatively new to this. I'm self-taught, what I do is strange. And when I was a part of the William King exhibit, I guess, was that 2019, 2018, 2019? I was just filled with anxiety about the whole thing and going there because I felt, you know, imposter syndrome and it was, it was lovely and everybody associated with it was lovely, but yeah, it was, I can definitely personally vouch for that. It makes it a little bit easier to get through that hurdle. I'm just glad to know Zoom now. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who didn't turn in early there was a little zoom tutorial at the beginning for folks uh, who were uh, coming online so um i know that for my part um those of those of you who know me know that i tried to turn my dining room into a gallery for the pandemic so um i would say that um that would not have happened or at least maybe would not have accelerated into existence without that um, you know, like very, I sort of sympathize with Eric and Lincoln and sort of the, the, one of the things that supercharges my energy to make work is to talk with other people about making work. I'm, I'm sort of like a, I call myself a creativity nerd. And like, I just, I love when people, what people decide to make, you know, like what, and what drives people to make something beautiful or what brings them to their uh, chosen medium. So um, like, I just wanted to talk to my art friends. And then I thought, well, you know, <laughs> let's like make it a thing and yeah. have people on display. And so this, you know, this exhibit that, um, that Spencer and Randy so graciously dropped in my lap is like, you know, my dining room gallery times 10. <laughs> so yeah. I was just like, I'm so excited. Like, I'm going to come and talk to a whole bunch of people. And, um, you know, like, I definitely, I definitely experienced that same, like I'm, I'm alone in the studio in the flow of the making. And that is sort of the addictive thing that you pursue. But um, just like the landscape can be a source of inspiration and energy. I think that I find some of my inspiration and energy in connecting with people and in, in the conversations. So, so once again, I will say thank you for being here for this conversation. This is um, this is so enjoyable, sure. and I want to congratulate each and every one of you for um, for everything that you have accomplished in the last year. Because last year was a challenge, and whether or not you continue to create or 
took a pause for whatever reason. Um, you know, we want to see more new work and this area needs, like, we all need art. We need it on a deep, deep level. And so, um, and if, <laughs> if you are an artist observing or somebody observing and you're making work, just keep going. <laughs> good. <laughs> I see Spencer nodding his head and checking in. Let's check in with Spencer. How many steps have you gotten in circulating around the gallery there? <laughs> He's checking his pedometer. <laughs> I, like, I guess I could. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we're doing, doing great. Um, yeah, yeah, I would, I would second everything, um, and thank you all for, for being a part of this. Well, do likewise. We have, do we have any other final commentary on the question from the audience about um, anything that folks have enjoyed about being able to be online that was not maybe previously mentioned or folks who didn't speak up? From a museum perspective, I will say, and probably Lakin and Anna Marie will probably agree with this, but in a weird, ironic sense, we've been able to reach a larger audience um, because we've been forced to, you know, how do we get people in such a visual experiential field, um, you know, access to it. So we have to think outside the box and, or inside this box maybe, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, so technically um, the museum, I think has been able to share its exhibits to a broader audience, maybe not in the ideal sense, but you know, it is a, a way to look at it on the positive that, that I've been trying to focus on. It's like, Hey, yeah, People in the doors, not so much, but people experiencing what we're putting out there, including this show, because um, this will live online longer than this will be in the gallery. So, so I'm I'm really pleased, and you know, not pleased with the pandemic, but pleased that we have this, uh, you know, technology at our fingertips. Well, I, I think this is the pandemic. There's going to be any crisis. Good things come out of it. And so uh, what we're doing right now, I appreciate you guys putting together, but that doesn't mean it has to end. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, hopefully we'll get up through this, but there'll be a lot more online. To, you know, my wife's in medicine is telehealth for certain things. You know, you really need to see somebody up close, but it's going to change a lot. And, you know, the bad will get weeded out, but the good will continue. And I think this is, you know, when I talked about being isolated, what I really meant was me and the work is I uh, I do like being around other artists, you know? I think I, we're all a little greedy. It's kind of like, well, I want to be alone when I'm alone, you know? But, you know, I do miss school and things where I go, hey, buddy, what do you think of this? You know, what's going on here? You know, that kind of stuff. So if it's virtual, it's virtual. If it's not, it's not. I don't even know if y'all are real. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it's a hologram. We're all impersonating other people. Maybe my we're all actors. Is right? <laughs> You're all actors. This That's, is the Matrix. Did the NSA hire you? <laughs> Just a mess with me. Oh. And I gotta say, real quick, Tony, I keep staring at you. Have an uncanny resemblance to my older brother. <laughs> So if, <laughs> it looks like George Clooney and Jack Black had a baby, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was. <laughs> you said it, not me. But you do look like my, my son, brothers. My son, he's 15 years old, and he says it all the time. I was like, well, I said if they both had a baby, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like you're probably right, Adam. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's a sharp kid. Well, I'd like to remind uh, all of our attendees. Uh, well, one, I want to thank our attendees for, for being a part of this virtual live event. And again, this exhibit is open to the public in person um, through March 12th. Uh, please reach out to the museum if uh, you want to arrange a visit. Um, but pretty much we're only recommending if you have, you know, more than four or five folks in your party. Um, but yeah, um, our phone number, 423-439-4392. And then you can also find more information about this uh, exhibit and the artists online at etsu.edu forward slash Reese, R-E-E-C-E. And I'm sure a lot I've of folks- I dropped a hot link in the chat, or if Ooh. it's over here, some people have it up here, or it's- Somewhere, yeah, on your screen. There. 
Thank you. <laughs> so <up there. laughs> yeah. So we'll be posting more about this through our Instagram and social media and other things, uh, more about the artists, about certain works. Uh, so stay tuned. Um, but yeah, this is one started as a conversation. How do we celebrate some local artists? And I think uh, we hit the nail on the head. So great job, everyone. And like we said earlier, keep making art. Well, and there's a special special thank you to Spencer and to Randy for hosting. And I would also like to give a very brief shout out to the artists who were not able to make it to the to the panel, to Mary Mary Knees, and to Jason Flack and uh, Stacy Williams. I'm not missing anybody, right? Those, no. Yeah, those are the three artists that um, did not get a chance to vocalize tonight, but um, whose work is absolutely worth seeing in person, as well as everybody here present. Well, thank you for doing it. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah, really appreciate it. Appreciate it. All right.